Welcome to Taxpayer Alert, which is a program sponsored by the Calaveras County Taxpayer Association. I'm its president, and I'll be your moderator at this session. And our guest, our special guest, is Eric Eisenheimer with the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association. How you do? Doing Welcome. good. Welcome. Thank <laughs> you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, this is uh, this is exciting because we've been um, we've been active in uh, supporting um, uh, Prop 13. And uh, tell tell me, Eric, uh, a little bit about your background. Why did you get interested in this kind of stuff? Well, you know, first of all, thank you for supporting Prop 13. <laughs> it's uh, it's an amazing thing that it's been around as long as it has, uh, 35 years or more now. Uh, me, personally, I got involved in politics back in college. I've been involved in politics. It's amazing how fast time flies. But I uh, got involved with politics with now Congressman McClintock. He was State Senator McClintock at that time um, in Thousand Oaks, where I'm from. And uh, got involved and really, really just trying to do something positive for our state. Really wasn't like intending to have a career in politics or anything like that. I, I certainly wouldn't have thought at that time that I'd still be involved in politics. But he was running for governor at the time, and he was my hometown state senator. So I decided to get involved, started the College Republicans chapter at Moore Park College, got a degree in business. So I actually thought I was going to work in business, but I uh, wound up getting a job at the Capitol and worked there for a year. Um, then I went on to go to Howard Jarvis, started a business as well. So I'm a small business owner. And uh, what kind of business? It, social media, web design, and campaigns. Okay. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I like business. I really like business. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, we, all, we all should uh, seize the opportunity to try to create prosperity for ourselves and those around us. So I'm a small business owner, so some of the, some of the issues related to business that uh, we hear about in politics have a little bit more meaning for me than they do for other people. And, uh, and also along the way, I uh, earned a master's in public policy and administration. Wow, that's quite a bit. Do you have a family? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been busy doing all that other stuff, but okay. uh, you know, I, I think it's probably Probably just about time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the way, uh, I, I guess it doesn't really make any difference at what point you start. The main thing is once you start, you want to stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, until death do you part, and I believe even then you don't part. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, um, on, the, on the Proposition 13, what are the benefits of the, of the uh, Prop 13 and Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association? What, what's, what's, it, what's in it for? property owner. Yeah, you know, well, first of all, Prop 13 was passed in 1978. And when it was passed, people's, people's property taxes were increasing out of control. People, especially senior citizens, people on fixed incomes, were literally losing their homes because they couldn't pay their property taxes. Prop 13 lowered them quite a bit, 57% put them at a reasonable rate, and then controlled the amount that they can go up. So all of us, whether um, you, had, you had a property in 1978 and still have it, or whether you're like me and you're a younger guy and you bought a house, um, you're protected by Prop 13. Because I bought my house, my property taxes can only go up no more than 2% a year, and that's because of Prop 13. It's uh, over the last uh, 35, 36 years, it's saved taxpayers over $500 billion. And wow. Howard Jarvis, the organization, their work, including Prop 13 and including um, other propositions, other work in the legislature, they've saved the average family of four $57,000. I think there's another proposition, uh, 218, isn't that uh, also? Uh, done by the Howard Jarvis? Prop 218 was, yeah, one that uh, basically strengthened Prop 13 uh, back sometime in the 90s. And, uh, and there's other things like efforts that Howard Jarvis has stopped. Like one of the first things that I worked on when I went there was no one one a which was a massive multi-billion dollar tax increase. They actually, they, they, they like to be deceptive. So they were telling people it was a spending cap. And uh, they, they, they weren't mentioning there was billions and billions of dollars in tax increases. So I had the opportunity to work on that. Really proud of that because uh, we defeated it by uh, almost two to one margin. Wow. 
Wow, that's um, that's uh, that's really good news for the taxpayer. Absolutely. Um, one of the uh, uh, what are some of the, the negative economic uh, things about a, the the uh, economic climate in California? What uh, what's happening with that, and can that be turned around? And how bad is it? It absolutely can be turned around. We uh, we have the fifth highest unemployment in America. We've got the highest sales tax, highest gas tax, um, highest corporate tax in the West, highest income tax. Um, all all statistics from the Tax Foundation. And even though our property taxes are reasonable because of Prop 13, they're not the worst in the nation. They're 19th highest. So it isn't like we're making out like bandits. It isn't like property taxes are low. They're, they're just reasonable. So overall, it's pretty bad. There's an annual survey of CEOs by CEO Magazine, and they consistently rank California worst in the nation to do business. Businesses, business owners are packing up and they're going to other states where taxes are lower and where the uh, regulatory climate. I mean, anybody, anybody that has ever had the opportunity to deal with the California Air Resources Board knows how harsh our regulatory climate is. So people are packing up, people that are business owners, and they're going and they're creating those jobs other places. And that's why we've got the fifth highest unemployment in America. However, the uh, silver lining to that, as Tom McClintock always says, is that these problems that we face weren't created by an act of God. They were created by acts of government. So if government could get us into this situation, uh, better policy could get us out of it. All right. So in this case, it looks like uh, the, the uh, people went directly to the, uh, to the Constitution and kind of handcuff the legislature in some ways to prevent them from hurting us more. But the only, the only people they saved were the property owners, not the people paying income tax. You know, at least not yet. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no, yeah, there's no limitation on income tax, and uh, it's uh, it is the highest in America. In fact, it's even uh, that they even have special millionaires taxes that uh, that go to a, a mental health fund that's been criticized pretty much across the board as uh, being unaccountable by lacking transparency by uh, even people that uh, advocated for this thing. Now they're seeing all the millions of dollars being misspent and not helping people and uh, are denouncing it. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's no constitutional protection in place on, uh, on income tax. So that is what it is. <laughs> well, I guess we have to live with it for now. Yeah. The main thing is we've got the communi communication that we're doing now where people are not afraid about uh, uh, about discussing it and discussing some reform to, to get uh, more limited government. And uh, that, that seems to be so important. Uh, one of the, uh, the government uh, bureaus that, uh, in California that uh, seems to be doing more harm than good is the Department of Water Resources. We have a tremendous problem with, uh, with water. And it, it seems like it's uh, decades ago, they started to plan for scarcity. Mm -hmm. Well, if you plan and plan for scarcity, and you plan for scarcity, you shouldn't be surprised if you achieve it. Well, so and, now we've achieved it. <laughs> and, and think about this. I believe it's been decades since we built any dams. Oh, yeah. And the population over the last 20 or 30 years has doubled. Right. So, so what do you expect to happen when you don't build any water storage and uh, you've got a population that's expanding and expanding? You, government, one of the things the government should do, I believe, is create the conditions by which prosperity can happen, right. by which people can prosper and the economy can flourish. Right. And we haven't built any refineries, we haven't built any dams, and, and then we're surprised when gas prices spike, we're, we're surprised when we don't have any water, and uh, it, it really shouldn't be a surprise because uh, the creation of infrastructure, you look at back in the day in the West, when the West was one, well, you know, the growth along the West occurred along where they put the rail routes. Right. So when you build infrastructure, like when you built the highways back in the 60s, 
That's where the modern suburbs came from. That's where the American dream came from. Those, uh, those suburbs sprouted alongside those highway routes. Yeah. So it's, it's one of government's most essential functions to create those conditions so that uh, people can be entrepreneurs, people can prosper, people can have the, the resources and the, and the infrastructure that they need so that, uh, that we can have the uh, economic conditions uh, of the 21st century. You know, that seems to be, uh, you seem to hit the nail on the head of a major conflict, uh, ideological conflict going on today. There seems to be two schools of thought, and there are good people on both sides. One school of thought is, well, we need to have um, planning by the collective. We need to have people together that would plan what their community should be and what the future should be, and even what the state should be. It should be uh, directed by government. Uh, using the collective uh, process of, um, of, of getting uh, 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 indications of what people want and then, and then seeing about government bringing that about. Uh, the other view is, is that um, the, the, there's a real conflict between collective power and individual rights. And our Constitution is based on individual rights to life, liberty, and property. Even though the Declaration of Independence is uh, pursuit of happiness, the original draft was property. They couldn't use that at that time because of the uh, uh, tremendous uh, 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 turmoil and uh, fear over the uh, slave trade. Mm -hmm. And so you couldn't put property in the, in the declaration. They say, oh, you're, you're, you want to own people. <laughs> well, anyway, um, so here we have over and over again the same thing played over again. And it seems like what you're talking about, we need to have the market determine how things are to be, not not the government, and certainly not a committee. I, I I think I think we got to look at some of the things those committees are declaring, because um, the, a lot of the planning and the uh, um, ideas that I'm seeing from them really really aren't in our best interest and really don't. I don't believe reflect what most of us even want. I think I think most of us want a prosperous society. I think most of us want a thriving economy. I I, I don't think that most of us want to uh, conserve water, conserve energy, live in a in a in a small apartment above a train station. You know, I I don't think they're listening to us because. I, I think that if they would listen, they'd see that, you know what? I mean, the reality is uh, we still like to drive. That's why we do it, yeah. you know? That, yeah, that, that's, that's why the freeways are so congested, because we all like to drive. So I think they should take, take their cues from reality and, uh, and, and look at, at a people whose very real concern is, you look at polls even, and uh, uh, the, the number of people who believe that uh, taking action about global warming is the uh, um, most important policy priority, uh, and a list of about 20 policy priorities. The, the number of people who think global warming policy is the most important is pretty much at the, at the bottom, the very bottom. But uh, the number of people who think the economy should be the priority, that's on the top. So I think in that light, you have to go, okay, well, what are people saying in polls? What are people saying by their behavior? And what people are saying is they want policies that uh, don't, don't throw up every obstacle imaginable to job creation because, oh my goodness, you might harm an endangered Brazilian water beetle. <laughs> yeah. that what they want is policies to create jobs. You know, you touched on one thing that's really important now is this uh, global warming scare. They, uh, since uh, 1998, the scientists uh, who record the evidence has shown it's been flat, there's been no global warming. So a few years after that, the leaders of the scare movement changed it from global warming to climate change. <laughs> the reason why they did that, because they knew there wasn't any more global warming, and we may be going the other direction, which would be a real concern. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting when you look at all of that. And, and one of the things that is really important that people realize is there's intelligent people on uh, of a number of perspectives on global warming and climate change, 
But uh, the reality is that even if California went back to the Stone Age, even if we just said, no, we're not going to use any oil and gas, we're just going to live in caves, we're not going not to do anything that creates any kind of emissions whatsoever, it would have a minuscule impact on, uh, on the world's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that we need to be realistic about, uh, well, how much economic harm do we want to do? How much do we want to harm uh, inner city communities? How many jobs do we want to kill? How much do we want to drive away the manufacturing sector, which creates the best jobs with the 40-hour work weeks and the benefits? Right. Do, how much do we want to destroy our economy just so that we can make what really amounts to a uh, to a, uh, a philosophical a statement, like a fashion statement, because it doesn't do anything. Yeah, the, uh, it may be possible that, uh, that CO2 is a tremendous benefit to the planet, and especially to plant life. And it may be, since CO2 increases follow global, global warming, as shown by the ice core uh, samples, that uh, apparently CO2 doesn't cause global warming. Wow, and now we have all this legislation, billions and billions of dollars uh, and uh, a stranglehold on our economy under the theory that looks like it's false. It, it, it absolutely could be. And, and one of the things that, that most concerns me when I listen to our policymakers is it really seems like they don't, they don't understand or they just don't care about the impacts their policies have on business and have on jobs. But in fact, one of the ways that uh, they're harming business and harming jobs that uh, directly affects, uh, directly related to Prop 13, is uh, their proposal for a so-called split roll. And, uh, you know, what that is, is uh, very much like some of the negative regulations we see from the Air Resources Board. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a proposal that would uh, eliminate Prop 13 for businesses, eliminate Prop 13 for job creators. You know, you take a person like me where, you know, I, I do a number of things. I've got my, my hand in, in more than one thing. One of them's Howard Jarvis, but then, you know, I, I've got an IT company too. And, uh, I, I think like any young business owner, I'd like to rent some space eventually for that business. And rents are high. If you take away Prop 13 for the people who own the, the space, who own the office space, well, what are they going to do? They're going to have to pay more in taxes. Their costs are going to be higher. They're just going to raise the rent. And they're going to raise the rent on me. They're yeah. going to raise the rent on, on the little guy, the small business owner, the job creator. Really, I mean, jobs are not created overall. I mean, big companies are great. I'm, I'm all for big companies, and I think we should love them and celebrate them. I think that uh, the, the, the people who want to bash corporations, I think they're very wrong. I think that they should thank corporations for the good they do. Um, and in fact, a lot of small business owners are corporations too. However, the real engine of growth in our economy is the small business owners. They're the ones who uh, contribute the most innovation, and they're the ones who create the most jobs. And what this will do, if they really do a split role, is it'll hurt the small business owners even more. It'll hurt minority-owned businesses. It'll, it'll hurt women-owned businesses. And uh, the cost to our economy, I uh, was estimated by Pepperdine University, $70 billion dollars over five years, if they do that, uh, would be the economic harm. About 300,000 jobs. And that's in California only. That's California, yeah. That's elimination of Prop 13 for business owners. And that's, uh, that's one thing on the agenda of the, uh, of the far left who don't like Prop 13. Yeah. Uh, and and they've, they've been saying this for a while. It's not, it's not new, but it does have a, have a new push behind it now. The, there's a group of people uh, in San Francisco and they're going around and they're, they're telling uh, local, local cities like Berkeley, not surprisingly, to <laughs> pass resolutions uh, saying that they don't like Prop 13 and they want to raise taxes on job creators. You know, when you, I, I just, it, it blows my mind that anybody would want to raise taxes on job creators. You, you know what I think they should do? I think they should have a celebration for job creators. I think they should have a job creators day, <laughs> day of appreciation. But, uh, That'd but be would cool. they, wouldn't that be, yeah. you know, a We'd festival, for that. <laughs> you know? But uh, no, they 
they want to do is raise taxes on job creators, and they're going around to uh, sympathetic uh, city councils and people like that, school boards, county boards of supervisors, and uh, they're uh, encouraging them to pass resolutions to raise taxes on businesses and eliminate Prop 13 for businesses. And uh, I, I actually serve in the uh, outreach part of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So uh, my, my title is uh, Director of Grassroots Operations. I'm kind of a, an outreach guy. And uh, this is my idea, and I'm real proud of it, that uh, we're, we're, we're now promoting the idea that local, local cities, uh, counties, and it doesn't uh, so far, it's always been uh, cities, but it doesn't have to be a city. It could be it could be a mosquito abatement district. It could be a water board. It could be it could be anything you want. It could be you and your buddies and you get together in your in your living room and, and do it. Um, we're trying to encourage people to. Uh, pass resolutions in support of Prop 13. We've got that on the website, hjta.org, under Taxpayer Action Tools. You can go, you can take it to your, uh, your city council, take it to your board of supervisors, and you can say, hey, check this out. We should, we should do a resolution saying that, uh, that we appreciate Prop 13, and we appreciate tax limitation, and, uh, and we appreciate our economy. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Well, our taxpayer, Cal Calaveras County Taxpayer Association, uh, took you serious, and we. Uh, you did. Thank yeah, you for we, that. We uh, download your uh, your proposition. We made a few editorial changes, and uh, our assessor uh, made some uh, changes that uh, she thought would be good, and we we uh, we took it to the board of supervisors, and we read it during the uh, public portion of the board of supervisors, where you can talk for five minutes. And then uh, we gave copies to them. We asked them to put it on the agenda. Well, we didn't hear a peep back for a long time, weeks and weeks, a couple months, not a peep. And so we sent emails uh, to, uh, to the supervisors inquiring about this. And finally, we got a uh, response from the chairman of the board. And uh, she said that she was going to have it on the agenda to be discussed during the correspondence portion of the meeting, which is at the very end of the meeting. This is after the media's already and left. People are tired. They want to go home. Right. You know, and I mean, they, I've they, been to they enough did. meetings <laughs> that I, I know at the, at the end, somebody starts to talk, you're like, please stop talking, I'm hungry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think there were two or three people in the audience when they got to that part of the, uh, that, that part of the agenda. And, um, and uh, the, the chairman did, did as she, she followed her word. She said that if there was a majority who would support putting it on the agenda, she'd be part of that majority. But if there wasn't, she's voting against it. And sure enough, we had two that would vote for it and not the third one. We lost. Mm -hmm. And so basically, we lost four to, four to one. But we did have one supervisor that thought uh, Prop 13 was a good idea and thought it should be on the agenda, and so we're really grateful for that. But even, even so, uh, that this occurred almost in the middle of the night with not a, no one knowing about it, we're going to do a news release about it and simply explain what, what we're trying to do and encourage people to read our, our, our uh, resolution to see if they would want to uh, have it you know, discussed by the board. And so we're not, not going to give up. We're still going to try <laughs> well, well, that's great, and and uh, you know we're we're up to right now ten uh, cities have uh, passed resolutions in support of Prop 13. But no counties yet. No counties yet. Not yet. But some okay. of the cities are pretty big. I mean, uh, like Irvine's one. Yeah. Uh, the city of Oakley, I believe, is one. Um, a few others. Uh, some of those cities have over a hundred thousand people that uh, have passed it. So. We're, uh, we're encouraged, and we've only been doing this for about a month, uh, promoting the concept of Pro Prop 13 resolutions. So uh, we've got 10. I, I'm expecting an 11th to come in next week. And, and I want to say, uh, especially to the uh, county supervisors in this, in this community, 
that uh, Prop 13, I, I, I don't know if you guys are Democrats, if you're Republicans, if you're independent, but, uh, but Prop 13 is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is really something that we all can get behind. It's something that passed overwhelmingly back uh, in 1978 uh, with uh, about 60% of the vote. Uh, Howard Jarvis, um, about a third of our members are Democrats. And, and the polling they've done today uh, by uh, third party objective polling outlets like Field, what, uh, what they're finding is uh, Prop 13 is every bit as popular now as it was back in the day. So this is by no means a uh, divisive issue or, or a controversial issue. I think that uh, the San Francisco activists, they, uh, they'd like to create some controversy because uh, at the end of the day, if um, you're really a, an extremist on the extreme left and you want to raise taxes by any means possible, then uh, they're going to really see Prop 13 as a, as a big obstacle because uh, it stands in the way of, uh, of their plans for unlimited tax increases. But, uh, but if you're a regular Californian, if, if you're a person, um, not even like me, I was going to say like me, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, I guess I'm a Republican operative, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, just, if you're just any average, ordinary Californian, like any of my neighbors, um, you're going to want Prop 13. You're going to want your property taxes to be reasonable. You're going to want, like a small business owner like me, you're going to want to be able to uh, locate your business in an office building and to be able to afford the rent. Uh, you're going to want, uh, if you're not a business owner, but uh, you don't have a job, uh, you want a job. You want access to opportunity. Uh, if, you, if you've got a job, but it's, it doesn't uh, give you full-time hours, that's a huge problem right now. Yeah. Uh, I know so many people, so many friends who have jobs, but they don't have full-time jobs. That's they don't have Obama, benefits. Obamacare. The, the employer can't hire anybody uh, full-time without paying a big penalty. Th that's one reason, but you know what? Here in California, the, uh, the fastest growing sector is, uh, is the retail sector, and, uh, and that's good, honest work. Any job is better than no job, but, uh, but the reality is a lot of retail jobs uh, have variable hours. Yeah. A lot of retail jobs are minimum wage jobs. The jobs that we're losing are the manufacturing jobs. It's the, it's the 40 hour a week, $20 an hour, good pay, good benefits jobs. And uh, we need to create, you talk about civil rights, you talk about the American dream, it's all about access to opportunity. And you can't have access to opportunity without creating the conditions where job creators can succeed. I understand that. Now, that if, if, what is the website for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association? It's hjta.org. There is a uh, email sign up there where people can receive uh, valuable information into their inboxes. And uh, I would encourage everybody to go there. Uh, I actually uh, update the news on there. It's uh, go there, you'll have a great time and, uh, and sign up for the email updates. It'll, it'll uh, enrich your life and help you uh, exercise your rights as a citizen. Well, that's great. Well, we also have another website and this is CalaverasTaxpayers.org. CalaverasTaxpayers.org has a lot of interesting things, and we seem to get involved in everything. But the most important thing we're trying to do is protect your, your, uh, your freedoms and keep taxes low. We want to thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again. This is Al Segala for the Calaveras Community Taxpayers Association.